Guys, welcome back to the channel. We have such an exciting guest for all of you out there. The amount of you guys out there that have always asked about diet, what your bird should be eating, what's good, what's bad, how to make your bird basically thrive with the best diet possible. You guys are in for an absolute treat. We have set up today on an amazing Zoom call with Dr. Jason Crean, biologist and avian nutrition consultant. Jason, say hi. Hi, how are you? <laughs> yeah, not too bad. Thanks so much for taking time out of your day to actually... No, thank you. What we've actually done today is asked all of our fans out there on Instagram, on YouTube, what they would like to know specifically about how to improve their bird's diet. And there were some absolutely amazing questions asked. So without further ado, let's get into this. And we're going to answer everything that you guys asked today. Now, we've actually categorized this for you guys. So we're going to start off uh, with the most common question uh, regarding pellets. The amount of people that ask questions about pellets. I'm going to read a couple out here. I would love to know what he thinks about pellets like tops. I would also love to know if he thinks pellets are necessary for most parrots at all. Some say their diet should be a 100% well-balanced chop. Others say there's no way we can feed a perfectly balanced diet on our own and that we should rely at least partially on pellets to make sure they are getting all the nutrition they need. That is an actual amazing question. And there is so many like this. Should budgies be eating pellets? What ingredients should one look for in pellets? And finally, the question, which really sums it up, is pellets really the best option for our birds? Jason, you have the floor. Oh boy. <laughs> so I feel like I have to do a whole dissertation on that. These are super common questions. I heard the word complete. I heard the word balanced in there. We don't know what complete or balanced is for Paris. Very, very few species have been studied. When they are studied, it's very narrow studies with very small sample sizes. So as a scientist, for me to say, like, we've got it figured out, it's all guesswork. That would be irresponsible of me to say that. What we have seen, you know, when I started as a kid, it was all seed diets. And then I remember attending one of the very first meetings that one of the companies had about here, here come pellets. We're all excited. And we were excited. Um, that was a, just about the time I met Dr. Karen Becker, who's a world renowned veterinarian, over 2 million followers on social media. So a lot of people know her and we thought they were going to solve problems and they did not. And we continue to see some of the same problems as far as nutritional deficiencies in parrots that are on a predominantly pelleted diet, just like the problems we saw with a predominantly seed diet. The common sense answer, a diverse whole food diet will cover all of your bases and will give the birds all the foraging opportunities they need based on their natural history, what the birds do in the wild. Now, I'm sure you know, macaws sometimes hang upside down to reach for food on tree branches, right? We should be giving them those types of things. Now, I know you're a free flyer, so your birds get lots of exercise, but even if you have a bird at home, there are plenty of ways to give them exercise through foraging. You know, all of those different types of foods have huge benefits, but as far as these questions about pellets, I don't feed pellets. The only pellet I offer is tops. I know tops came up and that's because it's a cold pressed whole food pellet. There's no synthetic vitamins or anything like that in there. And it's funny because I just, in one of my memories on social media this morning was an interview I did with Dr. Stacy Gellis, who's an Australian um, veterinarian. And um, he said the same thing, you know, the best way to get nutrients is in food, real food, whole food, not processed food. And they see the same health problems um, as a result of birds that are on a predominantly pelleted diet. That being said, tops is not a complete diet. They don't claim to be. You can't get a complete diet in a pellet. It's not possible. And birds in the wild, let me just say, there seems to be this myth that birds in the wild are flying around and it's a paradise and they're just, they've all these food items, you know, birds are having to watch for predators constantly. They're all victims to parasites. They eat nutrient poor foods. I mean, this is survival. This isn't thriving. Like thriving, we can do that. We can, we can give our birds the very best. And that's why I love being like a zoo consultant because those animals live much longer lives. We can do the very best as far as nutrition, behavior, um, enrichment, all of that stuff. But in the wild, as a biologist, like I know it's a rough place to live. So we can do better. We can go from surviving to thriving and thriving is when you offer them many different types of food items. Now I'm not saying 
that you put a whole food plate out and it's loaded with all this stuff because they're only going to eat what they like, right? I mean, we know that. The best way to do it is portion control so that they don't, they can't eat too much of any one thing. And I used the word predominantly before. Nothing should be a predominant part of the diet. Nothing should form a base to the diet. Like you, you mentioned chop, like veggies are great, but they shouldn't be the biggest part of the diet. There's all kinds of things parrots especially need access to. All right. So Jason, so it seems pellets aren't obviously the worst thing, as you did say, but no one really knows. I mean, obviously it is processed food and we want to diverse our bird's diet as absolute much as possible. So giving a bird a whole bowl of pellets for dinner or something like that isn't the best. I love that question. What ingredients should we look for in a pellet and what are so bad about the others and why? So one of the reasons that tops is popular is because it's cold pressed. It's not heat treated. You know, if you look at the past few decades of research, as far as why processed food, like we know processed food is not good for us and we are living organisms similar to our birds. So what goes in impacts our health. And when it comes to processed foods that are heat treated, which means they're heating them to the point of dryness so that they can sit on a shelf for a period of time. Yeah. Um, That's when inflammatory compounds form, especially when you look at like heated ultra processed grain, things, carcinogens, inflammatory compounds, those things form as a result of processing. No one's testing for those things as part of their safety protocols when they're putting this food out on the market. So we know what happens to these foods when we process them. We're heating them to the point of dryness. And Dr. Karen Becker has done quite a bit of work recently looking at dog and cat kibble because it's the same thing. It may have some different ingredients, but we know what happens to food items when we heat them to the point of dryness. We need to avoid that. That's that's not healthy food. What percentage of a bird's diet should be pellets? Would it be better to strive for none at all in that sense? I think that the, the ultimate bird diet is none. Um, okay. Like I said, with, with tops pellets, I offer my birds tops pellets because I, I don't have any problem with those. The yeah. ingredient list is very clear. I know how they're processed, which is minimally through cold pressing. Unfortunately, they're one of the only ones that process um, things in that way. There's two things you have to watch for. Synthetic vitamins, yeah, which is usually a whole list of vitamins that are standalone, that's okay. not part of food. Those are not going to be as bioavailable, which means the body doesn't readily absorb those vitamins and minerals like they would if they were part of food. There's something I refer to as synergy in, you know, if you're eating something, let's just say you take a vitamin C tablet every day. Most of us know if you take a vitamin C tablet every day, your urine is going to be a much stronger yellow color, right? You're because yeah. you're getting rid of a lot of it because your body doesn't know what to do with it. However, If you're eating a food that's rich in vitamin C, there's other compounds that are going to help your body readily absorb and assimilate that nutrient. And so um, I know there was a study on cranberry because cranberry extract is a popular supplement and it's like, just eat the cranberry because it comes with the package of those organic compounds that all work together to make that food item beneficial to consume. So um, those synthetic vitamins and the heat processing, those are two, two big, big, big things that are ignored, very, very ignored by even professionals who are recommending pellets. So in regards to a replacement for pellets completely, what would be the best? I mean, I've checked out Avian Raw Whole Food Nutrition on Facebook, which I believe is your Facebook page. It's got about, what, 15,000 people oh, there. Over 15,000, yep. It's just crazy. And the diets that people share there are just out of this world. You guys <laughs> need to go actually check this out. Like we're talking chop lists of morning chop and evening chop kind of dry mixes with at least... 30, 40 ingredients in each. And it just blows my mind. Would that be the best to give them what they need? So we're, we're looking at a few hundred types, different types of parrots alone, right? Yeah. So they all have their own various needs. We don't know what they are. So what we yeah. try to do is we try to generalize diets that we think are more appropriate based on our knowledge of them. You know, a lot of Australian birds, cockatiels, budgies, things like that, seed eaters. They eat lots of seeds in the wild, grass seeds and things like that. Not a ton of fruit. So 
if I'm feeding those birds, I'm not offering them tons of fruit. They'll get a little bit. Hopefully fiber rich fruits, apples and, and pears are great for them, things like that. But mostly green stuff, soaked and sprouted seeds are phenomenal because just the nature of a soaked and sprouted seed is it's you're enabling that seed to take its storage which is fat, carbohydrates, starches, you know, things like that, and convert them into something even better. You know, we're capitalizing on that natural process that seeds do. So that being said, you know, soaked and sprouted items, vegetable material, some fruits, um, some fruit seeds are great, like papaya and melon seeds, for example, pumpkin seeds, squash seeds, you know, any of those are phenomenal. They're awesome. And you just leave the pulp on them and yeah. let, them, let, them, let them have at it, you know, things like that. Um, and then as far as dry mix, I grow edible flowers um, for my birds fresh, but you can also get those dried. Um, they come in, um, in tea mixes. I would suggest getting a tea mix specifically for birds. And I know that over there you have polys and we have graywoodmanor.com also does a whole line of teas. I formulated for both of them. Those are great brewed as tea offered cold. And then um, you can offer them dry as well, or even whatever you steeped, you can put in your fresh food in the morning. Yeah. But in the morning when they're hungry, I want my birds eating fresh, moisture rich, fiber rich foods, even soak nuts in the morning, you know, just soaking nuts out of the shell overnight increases their digestibility. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, that's, that's hugely beneficial. And then at, in the evening or late afternoon with their dry food, freeze dried food is phenomenal, not dehydrated, freeze dried, freeze dried maintains 95% or more of nutrient dehydrated. Okay. But it's, it's oxidized. So if you freeze dry an apple, it maintains its color. But if you dehydrate an apple, it goes Brown. Like there's a reason for that. And that's oxygen. Yeah. So um, freeze dried foods, uh, dried seeds and grains and things like that are great. They're phenomenal. And I know when you and I talked before, like we sunflower seed comes up all the time and people pull out their torches and their pitchforks for sunflower seeds on social media. Like they're, it's the most evil thing ever. Sunflower seed is one of the most nutritious things you can offer your birds and eat yourselves. A huge source of vitamin E, great fats. It just shouldn't be the predominant part of the diet. But like I said before, nothing should. So yeah. a few sunflower seeds every day, phenomenal. You can soak and sprout them, phenomenal. Just diversify and control how much they get so that they have to eat many, many different things in a day. Yeah, Gr great answer. Really, really great answer. Um, Good, because I don't remember the question. So that's great. <laughs> <laughs> now, for you guys out there who are wanting to put something uh, like a big crazy chop together, morning chop, evening dry mix with nuts and seeds and fruit and veg and sprouts and legumes and absolutely everything with the flowers and all, um, what percentage of each should be what? I mean, are we looking... 10% nuts, 10% sprouts, 10% veg, 10% fruits. What would you say? I mean, obviously we want to make a huge, huge, big, diverse diet here, but is, should there be any more than one or should every single one of these items and categories be split evenly? You know, um, so the, the common sense part of me says that um, what's best is you use what you have. You hit, yeah. you, you know, you use what's in season, you hit what you have at your disposal and, you know, you shoot for as many things as you can get so that when you do take one scoop out of there, there's many different things to choose from and all of them carry with them nutritional benefits, you know, and keeping in mind a bird in the wild isn't, isn't going to a tree going, you know what, I didn't get any vitamin A yesterday. So I better, <laughs> I better get that today. Like they, that's not yeah. at all. They're getting, they're exploiting whatever food sources they can. Yeah. And, you know, when it comes to vitamins and minerals, they need very tiny amounts. That's why we call them micronutrients. These are tiny compounds. They need very little overall. Yeah. Um, and, they're, and just like us, they're not getting all of those every day. Right. So that being said, there's no hard, fast rule when it comes to percentages for any of this stuff. I often worry that if I offer some of the things that I do in my practice, that yeah. we're going to have people who are obsessing over it because they're worried that they're going to hurt their birds. Do not sit in front of a spreadsheet on your computer and total up everything you're offering to your birds. That is not going to be, yeah. and, and you laugh. I know people that have done this and they, they literally drive themselves insane 
yeah. over, oh, this is missing or this is missing, you know, those types of things. When it comes to percentages, if you buy a sprout blend, and, and there's plenty of sprout blends out there for That's humans, yeah. then it's already diversified. Yeah. And you're not going to get too much of any one thing. That's that's really the best. That's really the best way to go. It's not that you can't add things to that that you're soaking and sprouting, for example. But that being said, you know, if you're already buying a, a blend, that's probably already that work is done for you. So on that, I mean, I think a lot of people in the bird world will always feed. Well, should as we've been kind of told to always feed a whole lot more veg than fruit in that sense. Mm -hmm. If yes. we're looking just fruit and veg, if we're weighing it up side by side, the fruit should be between 10 to 20% compared to yes. the amount of veg, obviously. Something I, like think, I think 10 to 20% fruit um, is, is a nice comfortable number. Yeah. Um, I think that you can do a bit less yeah. for some of the Australian birds, for example, that aren't eating a ton of fruit in the wild versus birds in South America that are actually burrowing into papayas to get to all those seeds. But that yeah. being said, the seeds in a papaya, for example, or the seeds in a cantaloupe or a melon of any type, those don't have the same nutrition profile as the fruit that surrounds them, right? They're not gonna have sugar. So if you're offering those seeds and on, only those seeds from those fruits, right? Like yeah. pits, you don't, you can't offer pits. Pits have a toxin in them that you just don't need, um, you know, and, and things like that. Just, but, do you want to just break down briefly uh, the difference between a seed and a pip and a fruit? When it comes to seeds, things like melons, yeah. which also are squashes, cucumbers, you know, things yeah. like that. All of those have seeds that are completely edible. Yeah. Pits, pits, P-I-T-S. It's... um not pips yeah like you would find in pitted fruits um nectarines peaches plums things like that those you do not offer okay apples so, for example seeds apple seeds are fine people yeah. say that they're toxic birds yeah. would have to eat a large number of them to have any ill effects if you're not comfortable with that don't feed them plain yeah. as day <laughs> um but if a, if an apple seed slips into your your mash of you know fruit that morning it's not a big deal. I mean, yeah. I, I had a macaw who would not touch fruit until I put a whole apple on a skewer. And that was the magic. That was it. it all of a sudden, and then started trying new things. That was the gateway to better feeding. So core the apple, stick it on a skewer, shove some nuts inside there and, and let them, let them have at it. But if they get an apple seed, it's not the end of the world. A couple of things you actually brought up. I'm going to chat about. There was a really, really great question in regards to species and birds in Australia and stuff like that. How much should we be catering diet to the specific species we are feeding? It's hard to believe that a cockatoo and a macaw from completely different places in the world will both benefit from the exact same diet. I found that quite fascinating. I've never thought about that. I think big, large parrot eats large parrot food kind of thing, you know? <laughs> I mean, not to complicate things, but two different species of parrots that live in the same range could have vastly different diets. They could each be exploiting different foods within that same habitat. So we, we don't know, right? We, what we do know is that we know we're not going to have all of those same types of like tropical fruits and, and things like that, that grow in South America, Central and South America as Australia. But when you look at cockatoos in Indonesia, I've teamed up with Bonnie Zimmerman at the Indonesian Parrot Project. She, she literally sees what birds eat. I told her, you know, uh, people, when I, when I tell them to feed mealworms, for example, um, that parrots love mealworms. Maybe not all of your parrots because they don't recognize them re readily, but, you know, <laughs> they, do, they do and will eat them. We fed um, our guys a mealworm last week. They, yeah. me and I absolutely loved it. Eyes pinned. Mikey just took one bite, dropped it on the floor, and he yeah. tried to bite me the next time I tried to give it to him. So, yeah. And, and introducing <laughs> foods can take weeks to months of, of exposure. So, you know, I'm not surprised. But she says she's literally watched cockatoos extract larvae right out of tree bark and eat, the, eat them. So we know that these birds eat a host of different things that we wouldn't normally associate with what's freely available as quote unquote parrot food. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it, you know, when I educate the public about feeding birds and increasing the diversity of whole food in their diets, 
most don't realize you can soak and sprout and have something that much more nutritious within 36 hours for your bird. And you can do that right in your kitchen or, you know, the different types of fruits. And when I show people a picture of the produce section at my local grocery, you know, I tell them they can eat almost anything in this entire section. And people will say, oh, but I heard this, or I heard this, and I heard yeah. this. Nine times out of 10, it's myth. I hear mushrooms are bad for birds. They're, they're not at all bad for birds. They actually yeah. can have huge health benefits for birds. Anything yeah. that's edible for us is edible for them when it comes to mushrooms. Avocados are kind of the big exception. And it's not because avocados are bad, because parrots in the wild are eating them right off the trees. But avocados are made to ripen on the tree. And if we pull them so that they have an increased shelf life so that they can get to the grocery and, and still be good, that doesn't give them time to naturally ripen on the branch, which is where the toxins then leave the flesh. And so that's the exception, right? Um, but you know, I've heard all kinds of, of crazy things that everything's toxic and these poor fragile birds can't eat all these things. And I'm like, <laughs> nine, almost, almost everything in the produce section is safe. Almost ignore comments on social media where somebody says, you know, well, I heard that this is toxic, you know, or something like that. Cause it's okay. almost, it's almost never the case. Um, but you know, yeah. I, I tell people if you're uncomfortable, don't feed it. There's, there's hundreds of other things you could feed. I mean, you hear it with tomatoes, you hear it with olives. I mean, there's a bunch of other things people say are toxic and then you actually kind of look into them. A tomato isn't actually toxic at all. The vine on the tomato, completely yes. different story. Don't put that near your bird. The tomato itself. Great. Why not? Right. Um, and, and that's, and, and that's a problem with people's understanding of biology is I teach biology courses at the university with animal nutrition topics. And one of the things is if they look it up, they say, oh, tomato plants are toxic. They're part of the night nightshade family or whatever. And I'm like, but you're literally eating tomatoes all the time. Like that the <laughs> fruit itself doesn't, it doesn't benefit the plant. The plant yeah. wants an animal to eat it. So it can go void the seeds through its feces elsewhere and disperse its genes for it because the plant is stuck in the ground. That's just what yeah. plants do. And so when you look at what parrots do in the wild, they eat fruits, they void the seeds elsewhere. You look at toucans, they eat larger fruits with larger seeds and void those larger seeds. So like there wouldn't be a rainforest without parrots voiding, their, voiding all these <laughs> seeds everywhere through their feces. But when people look something up and see toxic, well, what part is toxic? You know, which, which part of the plant? Like I said, avocados is the exception because there's toxins in the fruit itself because we don't let it naturally ripen. But, you know, I have relatives in Southern California and the parrots eat the avocados right off the trees and the parrots are not falling <laughs> dead out of the skies. They eat them naturally. So, you know, don't feed avocados. Do not get on social media and say, I told you to feed avocados. But it is it is one of those things where it's the exception and most other things are okay. A lot of people are wondering uh, if they have, you know, smaller birds, medium-sized, bigger birds, how should that diet vary as such? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to mimic wild diets, Yeah. though we don't quite know what all those wild diets entail, right? The real question is, can you offer a generalized diet to different species and hopefully cover all of their bases? Mm -hmm. the, the answer is yes, you can do that, but you can do a little bit better where you can offer, for example, my black palm cockatoo will get more fruit than my cockatiel will yeah. because they eat different things. Even though they're closely related, mm -hmm. cockatiels and black palm cockatoos are actually very closely related, they're still going to eat some different things. And, yeah. and I'm talking aside from size, okay? okay? But when it comes to what we know, budgies, parrotlets, you know, some of those smaller birds that have really high energy expenditure and, and high energy needs. Seed is great, but yes, they need soaked and sprouted seeds, legumes. They need uh, green stuff to eat, um, you know, things like that. But seeds yeah. should absolutely be part of their diets. But when it comes to, you know, larger birds, you know, a walnut a day keeps the doctor away. Walnuts are amazingly healthy, super fiber, 
polyunsaturated fats, I mean, you can't, you just can't beat them. Should they be getting a handful of them every day? No. Should a, a larger bird get one or two walnuts? Yes, absolutely. Like that's, that's a fantastic food for so many reasons, but we have to stop as Dr. Becker says, we have to stop fearing food and, you know, fearing the F word fat. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, uh, so many will say, oh, we need to get rid of fat. But in reality, what we see in birds who are eating like lots of sugar and that sugar could take the form of bread, pizza crust, all this stuff that they should not be eating. I don't care if your bird likes it. Your bird can like things that are bad for it. Just look at, you know, how we eat. But when it comes to those types of things, it's the sugar that gets converted to fat in the liver through a process called lipogenesis. That's the problem. It's not the healthy fats in tree nuts, for example, that are beneficial. It's the sugars. And that's another reason why I have such an issue with um, some processed pellets, all processed pellets, because they're grain-based. Those sugars come with all of that. They're then heated and that transforms things. And that those can be very problematic. I currently have 22 species in my mixed species aviary alone. Wow. And, you know, I've got fruit doves, I've got wax bills, African wax bill finches, I've got Australian grass finches, I've got Nicobar pigeons, um, I have swamp hens, you know, just a yeah. myriad of different birds all living together. And when we put food dishes out, we want to make sure that there's fruit available. We want to make sure that there's seed available, soaked and sprouted seed, greens, um, mealworms, and other types of insects, in addition to what they're probably picking <laughs> picking up out there, because I watch them dig for grubs in the soil and all that other yeah. stuff. Um, so, you know, we have to generalize as much as we can and then, you know, offer some diversity that's going to cover, cover those bases. But once again, not offering so much food that they're only going to eat their favorite things and leave everything else. Of course. Yeah. Well, one thing a lot of people don't actually know is portion. Now, I think as you kind of progress as a bird owner, I think there's kind of, I mean, I want to say three stages, obviously, there could be a whole lot more, but when you first get a bird, you're obviously not as educated as obviously someone who's had a bird for a long time. So, you know, you go to the pet shop, you get a bag of pet food seed, you fill a bowl half full and you give it to them morning and night. On the other occasion, they can take a bite out of your hamburger, cheeseburger, they'll drink a sip of your coffee and eat some ice cream. That's, everyone's kind of done that. A lot of people clue up very, very fast that that's not good for their bird at all. Um, some people continue doing it, which is obviously a horrible, horrible thing. Then you have kind of people in group two who, you know, we rotate kind of 15-ish, 20 different veg and fruit, a little bit of fruit in the morning for their chop and pellets in the evening, which we are moving out of. Um, and then you got people like you and everyone in your group with this absolute crazy kind of mix of all these different ingredients, which I think everyone should obviously move to that way one day and just have so much diversity. Uh, portion size is such a big thing because when you first start feeding birds i remember we used to three quarter fill a giant bowl about this big yeah. with all this different fruit and seeds and veg and like that these birds crops are if, you know they're the size of a golf ball some of them you know um, where are they going to put that food and then owners are there complaining oh half my bird food ends up on the floor and i usually just look at them and say well how much are you feeding them and they're like oh yeah. you know a decent handful i'm like stop <laughs> Um, you had an amazing analogy about this. I saw once on small, medium to large birds and portion size. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what, what you're describing are the dangers of anthropomorphism. And that is incredibly dangerous. And I tell people all the time, you need to treat your birds like birds. They're yeah. not little feathered people. And <laughs> some people take that as you shouldn't take their emotions into account. That's not at all what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you have to respect a bird for the organism that it is, the needs that it has, and how we can satisfy that, right? And unfortunately, most of us live in a culture, and I'm highly generalizing here, but where if a little is good, a lot must be better. Yeah. And that any food, no matter how healthy, too much of any one thing is dangerous. When we look at food portions, I typically go by the tablespoon method. And I'm sorry, it's not in grams. I'm an American. Um, even though I'm a scientist, we still, <laughs> we still tend, to do, tend to do this because it's easier for people to understand. But um, I do the tablespoon method. So, you know, small birds, um, 
you know, budgies, uh, parrotlets, things like that, a lovebird, a heaping tablespoon of, of fresh food and a heaping tablespoon of dry food, morning versus, versus you know, evening. Um, that's a lot of food. And then you can add in enrichment items. So for example, with my lovebird, I may give them, you know, a heaping tablespoon of soaked and sprouted items and shredded veg and things like that in the morning. But I'm probably going to hang a, a leaf of kale in there sometimes mm -hmm. or, you know, anything for enrichment where they can work to shred or, or you know, mm -hmm. do whatever. With medium-sized birds like African greys, ringnecks, conures, things like that, uh, two tablespoons. And then larger birds like macaws, three tablespoons. Now, there's some room to play for macaws, especially. I'm not including tree nuts in that. So, yeah. you know, an extra couple of tree nuts is fantastic. Even if you're not free flying, birds still have the highest resting metabolic rate, right? Mm -hmm. Their heart hums even when they're not exercising. So like they need fat, they desperately need fat and not the type of fat in a processed food because yeah. you can't get things like omega-3s don't last the heating process. So you could see, oh, there's omega-3s in this food, great. But if it went through a heating process, they didn't survive. They put right. them in, which means yeah. they can put it on the bag, but they're not there anymore, literally yeah. gone. So they need a couple of tree nuts a day, you know, at least, even if they're resting, you know, yeah. resting metabolic rate. That one, two, three tablespoon method is a great place to start and if your bird's eating 100% of anything in a bowl, and I'm sorry, but I've never, ever seen a bird that ate 100% of anything offered. When it comes to, you know, if they're cleaning their bowl or there's just not a lot left and you want to give them a little bit more, not a problem because you started with a baseline and now you know how much food is yeah. being used, right? Yeah. Being utilized. So um, those are just good ways to to kind of think through how much food, because there are plenty of people out there who do the human method where they need food all the time. Like there's a bowl of food in there all the time, 100% of the time. I know people who are afraid to pull bowls at night because their bird's going to want a midnight snack. Like that doesn't happen, right? Birds yeah. shut off. Like they're photosensitive animals. They shut off. Now in saying this, we did actually get asked this question. Should you leave birds food in their cage or aviary? If so, how long? It's not something we do. Uh, we used to do it all the time, but now being free flies in the morning, they have an hour to eat their breakfast. And then usually we fly in the middle of the day. We take out about a handful of nuts between the two of them. So they're getting all their nuts while they're flying. I know people who don't free fly and they still use nuts and seeds as positive reinforcement. So they could yep. do big wings or high five and they're still getting their nuts that way. I think that's great. Um, but then obviously there's people like you who, you know, just love watching birds be birds or out in this absolutely giant aviary and they're just foraging and having fun. So there's no right or wrong way with this. Uh, but in regards to should they have 24 seven access to food? Yes or no? No. So there, there's a few, there's a few things in there that we have to quickly talk about. Um, birds are photosensitive creatures. Yeah. When it gets yeah. dark, they shut down, right? Their, yeah. their brain just shuts down. Um, and so even with my aviary, like the days are getting shorter as we record this right now, I have to make sure I go out into the aviary and pull any bowls that have been in there all day. Uh, because once it gets darker, I can't go in there because they're, they're, they're off. And if they get spooked, they'll, yeah. they'll flip thrash. Yeah. So for their safety, I have to be very careful when I go, when I go in and pull their bowls. First of all, you should only be feeding enough that your birds can eat within the first few hours. Yeah. yeah. Generally birds aren't going to eat any of that food beyond that time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And fresh food that's whole is going to not, it's, it's definitely not going to spoil to the point of being even remotely dangerous to your birds within that work day. Yeah. yeah. What does spoil that quickly is cooked food, which is why I cook no food for the birds. Mm -hmm. um, cooking grains and things like that, it destroys their natural protectorants. Like plant, plant-based have cell walls that protect them. So, you know, those, those foods can sit out and be fine versus cooked foods, which can spoil and mold very quickly. So I avoid feeding cooked foods. 
for that reason specifically, in addition to you know what we talked about earlier when it comes to heat and what it does to food. Some people are scared by their vet and veterinarians are so critical to our bird's health, right? I mean, we absolutely have to have respect for what vets go through just to become a vet. I wish vets were more trained in nutrition because that's just not part of the coursework like it should be. Mm. Um, And Dr. Becker and I just discussed this actually in an interview that she did with me as far as, you know, the need for more nutrition education with vets. And so, um, you know, we're, we're definitely, we're pushing for that. I'm asked to speak at vet schools about these very topics. Um, And the vet students are always very grateful because it's just kind of something that's missing in most uh, veterinary curricula. Basically, you can leave fresh food out while you're at work and pull the bowl. Um, but I always try to only put enough food in there following that tablespoon method that they'll eat within the first couple hours. Uh, this is quite an interesting one. So what can I give my green wing to help his beak be stronger? It seems to flake or chip easily. Well, that's so that's a veterinary question. So I can't uh-huh. answer that specifically. Um, anytime something like that starts happening, I get blood work done. Um, I want to know what's going on. Specific ailments like that, you definitely need to have blood work done first and foremost to see if there's anything underlying that's that's, um, a problem. You know, when you're looking at the diet, there's macronutrients and there's micronutrients. Now, macronutrients, we tend to focus on a lot because they're macro, they're big. Proteins, fats, carbohydrates. A lot of people make generalizations. Like we just said, fat is not a bad word right? It's necessary. Like we need fat for energy stores. We need fat for um, every cell in our body. Every cell in animal bodies are wrapped in two layers of fat lipids. So we need those in the diet, but people tend to make a lot of generalizations like, oh, if they eat too much protein today, they're going to become hormonal tomorrow. Like that's, that's not a thing. You're just generalizing it. There's a good few questions on that as well. Yeah. (laughs) and, And that's, That's not a thing. There are ways that people trigger those, but it's from sudden changes in diet and not diversity. And I'm going to say that very plainly again. If you are consistently offering a diverse diet every day, that is not going to trigger hormones in your birds. I've never had a hormonal bird in my life. Can can I just skip to these sprouts questions? Because there's just three of them. And I I, just because we are going into this exact topic. So Skittles Rainbow Princess says, I feed my birds chop and my own blend of sprouts mix that make a complete protein. My question is, how much protein do macaws really need? I've always wondered about sprout as in if they'll make all the birds nesty and hormonal if provided daily. On the other hand, there is no other food more rich in nutrition as sprouts, even for humans. Or maybe it depends on how far gone the sprouts are. If they're just peeping out of the seed or fully grown or anything in between. So does that matter in regards to sprouts and hormonal and nestiness? And also, what is the best food to feed a hormonal bird other than no warm and soft foods, obviously? Yeah. Um, so stop, stop cooking. Don't cook for your birds. Yeah. It, I mean, the exception is something like sweet potatoes where you could lightly steam them to make them softer, which then allows the vitamins to be a little bit more available to the body, but, and don't offer them warm. Um, That's a human thing. Once again, anthropomorphic, don't do it. Would sweet potato be the only thing you would say that should be cooked, nuked, warmed, uh, and obviously fed cold? Would there be anything else on the spectrum? Some of the squashes you could, I, I mean, I've always offered them just raw, yeah. Um, I want the birds to really have to work for their food, um, yeah. you know, really, really get in there. But generally, no, I don't I don't even cook sweet potatoes. I, I, yeah. I offer them raw um, yeah. and people will say, oh, I heard that was dangerous because there's anti-nutrients in there. And I'm like, birds eat that's a that's ton of things that's... in the wild with anti-nutrients like they're yeah. eating tons of that stuff. So that's not dangerous. It's not going to hurt your bird. Um, they're still going to get some nutrition out of out of that food. Um, but when it comes to hormones, no, I mean, I offer sprouts every day of the year, year round, never have any issues. Um, I soak everything for 12 hours. I let it sprout for 24 and then I'm feeding. So yes, it's when those little tails just start to come out, just feed them. Then you don't need big, long tails and all that sort of thing. You can grow things into microgreens. Some things will grow into microgreens and microgreens are actually more nutritious than the adult version. So kale microgreens are better 
um, nutritionally speaking, than a whole big leaf of kale. Now that doesn't mean you shouldn't feed whole leaves of kale because birds like to shred them. You can hang them in cages, canaries and finches. They like to bathe in wet leaves sometimes. And then they pick at them. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do to make your birds um, more content. But when it comes to sprouts, that itself is not going to cause your bird to be hormonal. Um, And to the protein question, we don't know. We don't know how much protein these individual species need. Offering the sprouts um, along with chopped veg and all that stuff, um, they're not going to get too much of any one thing. So you're not going to have to worry too much about that. Yeah, yeah. And like you said earlier, as long as it's not obviously just a whole bowl full of sprouts, as long as it is kind of mixed up with fruit and veg, you know, Mm -hmm. out of the three tablespoons, maybe half a half a tablespoon could be sprouts kind of thing. So oh, yeah, guys, or, a whole, yeah. or a whole tablespoon. I mean, uh, with my mash that I make, um, I'm going to venture a guess and say that it's probably almost half soaked and sprouted items. Yeah. Um, in soaked items, like something like split peas, I just soak overnight and feed them buckwheat. You can just, you yeah, can soak them for 15 that. minutes and just throw them in the cage. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. um, quinoa, you can soak for two hours and offer right away. Um, but I don't cook any of those. All of that is just soaked and sprouted, soaked and or sprouted beans. How you have to sprout though. You cannot just soak beans and offer them. Yes. Um, how many ingredients would you put in one of your daily chops? On average, there's probably 40 to 50 items that are in there. And that includes like all the different types of seeds and legumes that I both yeah. soak and or sprout veg that I shred and mix in there. I always add some dry items to soak up any excess moisture. So it's very crumbly and not soggy because the integrity of the food, the birds will notice. So I will take one of those tea blends that are made specifically for birds, um, the flower, dried flowers and and, and leaves and things like that, along with shredded coconut, uh, rolled oats and -hmm. throw those in and mix it all together. And that all absorbs that excess moisture. Um, So overall, there's probably 40 to 50 items that they can choose from, but whatever scoop I give them that day, we'll have a different randomized complement, right? So they're still getting diversity, lots of diversity every day, but that that combination is totally random. On the question earlier on what's the best kind of thing to feed a bird who is hormonal at the time. Now, we're obviously no experts on this, but we've found cutting out nearly all fruit or at least 90% of fruit calms them down a little bit. We increase sleep, reduce cuddles, and we offer a lot of avian tea, um, which we actually found through you. Uh, do you want to touch on that, on why they actually do work in that sense? Uh, yeah. And my tea journey, <laughs> um, <laughs> my, my journey into tea started actually with Dr. Karen Becker. This is earlier in her career. She had come to, uh, this was back when I was up in Chicago We had a bird group there that would meet once monthly and she came and talked about tea and I'm like, Oh, this sounds fascinating. And she learned about it through European zoos because she actually did her internships in German zoos. And she said their tea being used with animals is very common. (laughs) So when it comes to things like hormones, we started looking at what type of things have been researched, what ingredients have been researched, whole ingredients, Um, that help balance, um, like what are immunomodulators? What helps balance the immune system? What helps balance hormonal surges? And I was breeding Goulian finches way back when, and I would, you know, being in Chicago where it's cold half the year and dry, um, egg binding was a problem sometimes. And I started doing some research and found, you know, women all over the world seem to be drinking raspberry leaf tea during childbirth and that helps stimulate uterine contractions and and sure enough worked like a charm with those little tiny birds and um then we started offering it to other animals which also helped even gorillas you know gorillas at zoos have have had it uh babarusa i know they used it for um those uh wild kind of wild pigs in, in that they have in zoos so we just started looking at all of these things And even calming, like we all know what chamomile, my Italian grandmother knew, chamomile, like that's, that was, that cured everything, stomach upset, you know, drowsy, all that stuff. And we know what the organic compounds in those items are. We know what they do. And so we can now apply those. 
but you got to make sure it's a carefully formulated thing because once again, too much of any one thing can be problematic. There are some items that have cormorants, for example, that would act as blood thinners. We, we want to try to avoid too much of that. So we have to balance these things so that they're getting a safe amount when they're steeped and diluted. Yeah. Um, and so don't just buy a tea where stuff's thrown in a bag and, and you're good. It's got to be formulated by yeah. someone that has some experience um, yeah. and, and can sign off on it. We just keep finding new, new things, new whole foods that we can put into teas that can help benefit our birds. Yeah, those avian teas are amazing. I mean, we've um, we've tried the Greywood Manor one, and both our guys absolutely love it. We have the Polly's Natural Boutique one, and that's honestly, it's amazing to sprinkle on a chop as well. We have Codex one who said his bird dislikes all nuts apart from millet. Can he use fruit as training and rewards, or would that be too much sugar? Now, you did bring this up earlier in regards to sugar. He feeds chop in the morning and Harrison's pellets in the evening. Would you suggest he pushes for nuts more? I'm not too sure. Uh, two green cheek conyers, he said he's got. Yeah, so um, based on the food that he's feeding, he's not getting any any useful omega-3 fatty acids in any of that food right. that you just listed. So yeah. Um, we, yeah, you need to figure out a way to do that. Now, there could be, there could be various ways to do that. Um, and like I said, sometimes we just have to trick our birds into better nutrition. And that could yeah. involve... Um, soaking the nuts overnight to see if they'll take them that way. It could yeah. be chopping them into small bits and mixing them with other foods. Yeah. It could yeah. be, um, you know, putting them into a food processor and making a, a butter, a nut butter, which then is much easier to offer off of a spoon because you can yeah. mix it with all kinds of things that the bird likes. There's definitely different ways, but yeah, offering, offering those foods that he's offering are, there's he's no omega-3s. So you definitely want to make sure that you're getting omega-3s in there. Amazing. Cool. Thank you. Here's quite an interesting one. And I think a lot of people, um, not a lot of people will relate, but uh, some will. Can plucking be linked to diet? And if so, what diet would you recommend for a bird that plucks? So that's, and that's a tough question to answer because plucking is from, from what we've seen and what I've heard from vets, um, it's multifactorial. It can be a combination of factors in the environment that can lead to that. That being said, if they're plucking and that's a result of inflammation, then you need an anti-inflammatory diet. And the best way to get anti-inflammatory compounds is to offer whole food. So um, things like soaked and sprouted items and veg are all going to carry with them antioxidants yeah. that help reduce inflammation. Um, things like tree nuts have omega-3s. Omega-3 fatty acids are anti-inflammatory, okay? Omega-6s, however, which are common in peanut food, like I, that's, I don't offer peanuts at all for many reasons, but um, omega-6s are pro-inflammatory compounds. So the more pro-inflammation, the more anti-inflammatories you need to offer to counter that. So if you're feeding a food that has peanuts in it, my, my first my advice would be stop, <laughs> read, read the ingredients. If peanuts in there, just stop feeding that food. Right, right, yeah. um, but when it comes to, you know, and, and even with sunflower, you know, sunflower has omega-6s. So you don't want to feed a ton of it. You only feed mm -hmm. a little bit, but it's very nutritious, but you also need to counter that with what other things. So you've yeah. got other types of antioxidants using fruit like blueberries, phenomenal. Berries are low carbohydrate. They're not going to be a ton of sugar. Um, high in bioflavonoids. So anything that has that, those strong pigments, for example, um, are high in bioflavonoids. Those act as antioxidants. So you want to reduce inflammation. Yeah. And, you know, things like peanuts and a ton of seed is going to be more inflammation um, versus the whole food that's actually alive right? Like greens and, and things like that, that are going to help reduce the inflammation. And tree nuts are one of those um, huge, huge benefits because of the omega-3s. You could also do hemp seed, chia seed, flax. Those are also higher in omega-3s, but peanuts, you know, peanuts are just one of those foods yeah. I avoid altogether. They don't need I've, them I've heard, for any reason. I've heard a lot. People don't really want to feed their birds peanuts for many reasons i've, I've never looked into it but we kind of just stay away from them just because 
that's, that's what you hear, isn't it? So, yeah. Um, yeah. on that with um, with all the seeds, obviously, smaller birds, budgies, cockatiel stuff do need a lot more seed in their diet uh, than you know larger birds like macaws. Uh, should macaws still have a variety of seeds? Um, whether if it is, I mean, obviously, it should be more of a homemade seed mix, seed mix of proper human grade seed than stuff you get at the pet shop. But is that needed as such, or will it benefit them? Or is it just more of something that adds that extra bit of variety to it? Yeah. And I mean, not all seeds are created equal, (laughs) clearly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, Um, You know, hemp, hemp and flax and chia are amazing. And it's, it's amazing to watch a macaw, big old macaw manipulate a tiny little flax seed. Um, But those that's enrichment as well. So that's, that's all beneficial. But when it comes to seed, seed has its place in all parrot foods, whether you're looking at a budgie um, or you're looking at a macaw, um, there's seed has a place. Uh, You want to select seeds that are beneficial. Um, You know, I I don't offer a ton of any one type of seed. Um, I don't offer really any of my birds. They eat very, very little white millet. And if you look at budgie food or finch food, you know, things like that. It's predominantly white millet almost all the time. Um, I don't want a predominant part of any diet. I want lots of diversity. So I'm currently, I'm currently formulating um, seed mixes with freeze-dried components and things like that right now where they'll have all that diversity together. That's the goal. Seed has its place. Seed is not the devil. Seed is great Yeah. in, sm- in quantities that are part of a, a highly diverse diet. Um, also, um, I think a lot of people are going to start asking this question after this video. Anyone can go to a grocery store, buy a bunch of produce, cut it up, feed their birds a wet chop in the morning, uh, Mm -hmm. for an evening meal. If we're taking out pellets and stuff like that, where would you get the ingredients? Um, do you recommend anywhere? Do you just shop on Amazon to get the freeze dried stuff, to get the best kind of seeds, to get flowers to get you know all that kind of exciting goodness i know there's some amazing places in the states that only ship within the u.s mm-hmm. and nowhere else china Pri, uh there's a few others what about the rest of the world yeah it and that's yeah, it's tough um, <laughs> human grade seeds and grains and things like that my favorite places to go are ethnic markets because yeah. there's so much more diversity than the traditional generalized grocer. Here in the States, you know, when, when I go to um, Latin markets, Asian markets, um, Indian markets, you get a lot more produce. So going to those, those ethnic markets, there's so much, there's so much diversity there. Mm-hmm. Um, and all of it's human grade, and they typically carry a much larger variety of things that you can feed dry as far as grains and seeds, but also things you can sprout. Um, You know, lentils, you're you're hard pressed to find lentils in in a traditional grocer, but you go to an ethnic ethnic market and there's just like 18 different types of lentils. It's phenomenal. I love it. Yeah, definitely hitting up the markets. And (laughs) freeze-dried stuff. I mean, obviously I can't imagine walking to a market or a grocery store to find a freeze-dried broccoli. Anyone you'd recommend website-wise that does... yeah, and, and from what I know, from what I've heard from um, distributors who do sell freeze-dried products, that is easier to get shipped internationally than um, some whole food seed, like seeds, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and in places in Australia, for example, Australia is a tough, tough sell because they irradiate everything um, yeah, yeah, yeah. organic that comes through. So, um, you know, freeze-dried stuff, you... You, you really can't lose because freeze drying doesn't require any chemical. It doesn't require any treatment. There's yeah. no heat involved. Um, you're simply basically flash freezing and drying something to maintain the nutrients so that they don't degrade. And yeah. so if it's truly freeze dried and be careful, because when you search on some place like Amazon freeze dried, they will give you a list of dehydrated foods. Okay. And those aren't the same as freeze yeah. drying. And like I said earlier, some dehydrated fruit is fine, but you know, if you really want the nutrition, it's, it's freeze dried. Right. Wow. Amazing. Good to know. All right. Uh, next question. And here's an interesting one. Uh, any diet recommendations for a flightless parrot? If you have a bird at home, that's not flying every day, 
it depends on their energy level, uh, their exercise level. So are they, you know, do you have your bird hanging upside down and reaching for food? Are they using all parts of their body? Because that's all valuable exercise. Never, ever diminish that type of exercise. Even having your bird reach for something that you're holding, um, you're not teasing the bird. You're trying to get it to work muscles that it probably doesn't work every day. So, you know, definitely consider, consider those things. Stick with the tablespoon method that I talked about earlier, and then adjust from there based on, you know, how much they're actually consuming. And I love what you guys do because what you're doing is you're withholding, you're not starving your birds. Your birds are getting a really healthy whole food diet. And then you're supplementing things like the nuts and seeds as rewards for flying, right. During their exercise. So that's, that's phenomenal. Yeah. Um, just on that foraging, making food really, really exciting for your birds to get. I mean, in the wild, no one's bringing them a bowl of food in the morning and a bowl of food in the evening. <laughs> so um, we try and make it as adventurous as possible. I mean, sometimes we get lazy. We used to get huge big tree branches, drill huge holes in them and fill them with little nuts and little seeds and foraging wheels. And like we have these amazing foraging toys right now. It's crazy and they literally have wing nuts and you can tighten them as tight as humans can actually tighten them and the birds will still manage to get in there figure it out yeah (laughs) it's it's absolutely amazing um and they love to do that birds love to work for their food it's how they get stimulated so if you are feeding a massive massive variety you know have some of that for them to actually forage on and uh you'll probably see a much happier parrot so before we do wrap up um a lot of you guys that are actually watching this some of you may be on literally just seeds uh they could be your own homemade seeds they could be from a pet shop and you want to move to fruit and veg you might want to move to dry mix you might want to move to involving you know the 40 to 50 ingredients that jason here uses but a lot of you guys and this is why we made this video uh you've tried to offer it to your bird and your bird just hasn't touched it now a lot of you guys say my bird never touches anything apart from their seeds now what I would say, and what we actually did, we very, very quickly phased out everything else. We'd, for example, one day it'd be half their seeds and then half the new food. The next day, a quarter seeds and then three quarters of the new food. And then on the final day, they literally got no seeds at all and they haven't since. Yeah, they didn't eat as much and they did complain a little bit more. And the thing is with I feel with birds, they are survivors. They're not going to sit there and starve. They will sit there and wait if they know more food is going to be coming. But if you can be strong, then they will just eat what they are given. I mean, what are your thoughts on this, Jason? Is it That's 100% right. Um, yeah. Whenever you're transitioning the bird, this is not about the bird's behavior. This is all about human behavior. Yeah, birds, I agree. <laughs> you know, we, worry, we worry that our birds are going to starve. I have never, ever had a bird that would starve. I've never seen a bird that starved during food transitions. Um, I know there's someone watching this go, oh no, you don't know my bird. I yeah. guarantee <laughs> there is no bird out there that's going to starve if there is recognizable food items. You know. And what you did was for a couple of days, you mix things that they recognize with food that they don't. And that's one of the, yeah. the reasons that I love feeding a mash like with soaked and sprouted items and veg and, you know, the teas and all that stuff mixed together, because if they don't recognize something as a food item, but it's associated with the food item that they do recognize, they're more likely to try it. Yes. So So absolutely. This is, this is about changing our behavior as humans and you, whatever you want them to eat needs to be offered in the morning when they're hungriest and don't offer those other foods until they've had a chance to at least sample there will um, you will be fine <laughs> there will be birds that will scream i mean i remember yes. trying to give mikey a fresh bowl of chop after his whole you know first few years of his life just on seeds mm-hmm. uh, and he just sat there looked at it tossed it out of the bowl and screamed we caved a few times uh, and then we just basically sat down and said this is it he's going to eat this and nothing else that's we were training with a guy at the time and he said just give them the food and it took us three days, uh, those three days where we cut down the portions and then he was just eating it and he was like, all right, there's nothing else coming. I'm not going to sit here and die. I'm going to eat. And that was it. And I think, as you said, it's all human error in that sense. People, they, they love their birds so much. They don't want to see their birds screaming and hungry. They want to give their bird what they want, but yes. that bird will never, ever, ever want to touch 
all this other new scary food if right. they know if they just hold out and scream for a bit something their favorite yeah. so keep them back. I mean I, I often equate it with um the mother who is a screaming child in the checkout line at the grocery yeah, yeah yeah right and and what what i see more often than not is they just give their kids something to shut them up right yeah. <laughs> but that that you just reinforced a behavior that's going to be really yeah. difficult to exactly. train out and you cannot do that with birds they yeah. they have it figured out they will figure it out um yeah. so you know you gotta you gotta treat them like birds and give them what you know that they'll they'll eat you know know that there's going to be a transition period where you know they're they're going to test you they're going to it'll oh. be a battle of wills and to be honest some of the smaller birds are, are so so much more difficult you, you will get there and your bird will get there thank you so much jason for honestly just giving us your time and information today before we do wrap up um did you want to have any final words no, I, I mean, I appreciate being part of this. I can talk about food all day long when it comes to our <laughs> animals. Um, just keep in mind, you know, veterinarians are critical to health. So food should never um, be used to solve a health problem. Make sure you're going to the vet to make sure that there's not some underlying health problem with your birds. You know, I'm sure you'll get comments about this because anytime you talk about food, there's someone that it just doesn't sit well with or for everybody that's that wants to comment and say, this is rubbish. Um, you know, just keep in mind, this is a marriage of science and common sense and a lot of observation and interviews with people who have been feeding birds for decades. And so all we're trying to do is give our birds the very best nutrition and enrichment, which then will just enhance their life and get them from surviving all the way up to thriving. That's, that's the goal. So if any of you guys do want more info and want some absolute amazing recipes, Avian Raw Whole Food Nutrition, that is the name of the Facebook group. Join the 15,000 plus there doing their absolute best to give their birds the best diet they possibly can. <laughs> yeah. And I do post, I do post, um, uh, things on Instagram, Dr. Jason Crean, D-R, Jason Crean, C-R-E-A-N. Um, and it's the same handle on TikTok. We're, we're starting to put uh, videos on there, quick interviews, quick quick uh, tidbits and stuff, stuff like that that you can use to, to help improve the lives of your birds. All of this is going to be linked below. So you're going to have Jason's Facebook page, Instagram, <laughs> TikTok. And I might actually link that podcast, um, the one which actually brought me to you um randomly heard it which is from the that. perch yep. <laughs> yeah yeah it was it was such an amazing podcast i thought all right i need to get this guy on this channel he needs to share his knowledge with everyone this is amazing <laughs> um, so Thanks. thank you thank you guys so much for tuning in um 100 like i did say check out all of jason's channels below and uh i promise you guys will give your birds the best life hope you guys enjoyed this and stay tuned see you soon